Tilan is helped off the bus in the dressing room. There's a, there's a mixture of emotions. There is anger, relief, joy. Players and coaching staff are being examined by paramedics. Tilan and Parnavitana are taken by ambulance to hospital. We all sit in the dressing room and talk. Talk about what happened. Within minutes, there is laughter and the jokes have started to flow. We have, for the first time, been a target of violence and we had survived. We all realize that some of our fellow Sri Lankans, we, we all realize that what some of our Sri Lankans experienced every day for nearly 30 years had just happened to us. There was a new respect and awe for their courage and selflessness. It is notable how quickly we got over that attack. Although we were physically injured, <coughs> mentally we held strong. A few hours after the attack, we were lifted to the Lahore Air Base, Air Force Base. <coughs> Ajanta Mendes, <coughs> his head swathed in bandages after multiple shrapnel wounds, suggests a game of poker. Tilan had been brought back sedated but fully conscious to be with us and we make jokes at him and he smiles back. We were shot, grenades were thrown at us, <coughs> we were injured <coughs> and yet we were not cowed. We were not down and out. We are Sri Lankan, we thought to ourselves, and we are tough, and we will get through hardship, and we will overcome, because our spirit is strong. This is what the world saw in our interviews immediately after the attack. We were calm, we were collected and rational. Our emotions held true to our role as unofficial ambassadors. A week after arrival in Colombo from Pakistan, I was driving in Colombo, and I was stopped at a checkpoint. A soldier politely inquired as to my health after the attack. I said I was fine and added that what they as soldiers experienced every day, we experienced only for a few minutes, but still managed to grab all the headlines. He looked me in the eye and he said, it is okay. It is okay if I die, because it is my job, and I'm ready for it. But you are a hero, and if you were to die, it would be a great loss for our country. I was taken aback. <clears throat> How can this man <coughs> value his life less than mine? His sincerity was overwhelming. I felt humbled. This is the passion that cricket and cricketers evoke in Sri Lankans. This is the love that I strive every day of my career to be worthy of. Coming back to our cricket, the World Cup also brought less welcome changes with the start of detrimental cricket board politics and the transformation of our cricket administration from a volunteer-led organization run by well-meaning men of integrity into a multi-million dollar organization that has been in turmoil ever since. In Sri Lanka, cricket and politics have been synonymous. The efforts of the Honorable Garmini Desanayake were instrumental in getting Sri Lanka test status. He was also instrumental in building Asgiria, the international cricket stadium in Kandy. In the infancy of our cricket, it was impossible to sustain the game without state patronage and funding. <clears throat> When Australia and West Indies refused to come to our country for the World Cup, it was through government channels that the combined World Friendship Eleven came and played in Colombo to show the world that it was safe to play cricket there. The importance of cricket to our society also meant that at all times it enjoys benevolent state patronage. For Sri Lanka to be able to select a national team, it must have membership of the sports ministry. No team can be fielded without the final approval of the sports minister. It is indeed a unique system where the board appointed selectors at any time can be overruled and asked to reselect a side already chosen. <coughs> the sports minister can also exercise his unique powers to dissolve the cricket board if investigations reveal 
corruption or financial irregularity. With the victory in 1996 came power and money to the board and players. Players from within the team itself became involved in power games. Officials elected to power in this way, in turn, manipulated player loyalty to achieve their own ends. At times, board politics would spill over into the team, causing rift, ill feeling, and distrust. The only shining example to the contrary I can remember was the interim committee headed by Mr. Vijay Mallasekara, who's sitting here today in the audience. <coughs> Accountability and transparency in administration and credibility of conduct were lost in a mad power struggle that would leave Sri Lankan cricket with no consistent and clear administration, presidents and elected executive committees would come and go, government picked interim committees would be appointed and dissolved. After 1996, the cricket board has been controlled and administered by a handful of well-meaning individuals, either personally or by proxy, rotated in and out depending on appointment or election. Unfortunately, to consolidate and perpetuate their powers, they opened the door of the administration to partisan cronies that would lead to corruption and wanton waste of cricket board finances and resources. It was and still is confusing. Accusations of vote buying and rigging, player interference due to lobbying from each side, and even violence at the AGMs, including the brandishing of weapons and ugly fistfights, have characterized cricket board elections for as long as I can remember. The team lost the buffer between itself and the cricket administration. Players had become used to approaching members in power, directly trading favors for mutual benefits. And by 1999, <coughs> all these changes in administration and player attitudes had transformed what was a close-knit unit in 1996 into a collection of individuals with no shared vision or sense of team. The World Cup that followed in England was a debacle, a first round exit. Fortunately though, this proved to be the catalyst for further change within the dynamics of the Sri Lankan team. <clears throat> a new mix of players, a nice blend of youth and experience, provided the context in which the old hierarchical systems and structures within the team were dismantled, and in the decade that followed under the more consensual leadership of Sanat, Marvan, and Mahela, the team continued to grow. In the new team culture forged since 1999, individuals are accepted. The only thing that matters is commitment and discipline to the team. Individuality and internal debate are welcome. Respect is not demanded, but earned. There was a new commitment towards keeping the team safe <clears throat> from board turmoil. It has been difficult to fully exclude it from our team because there are constant efforts to drag us back in. And in times of weakness and doubt, players have crossed the line. Still, we have managed to protect and motivate our collective efforts towards one goal, winning on the field. We have to aspire to better administration. The administrators needs, need to adopt the same values enshrined by the team over the years. Integrity, transparency, commitment, and discipline. Unless the administration is capable of becoming more professional, forward thinking, and transparent, then we risk alienating the common man. Indeed, this is already happening. <coughs> Loyal fans are becoming increasingly disillusioned. This is a very dangerous thing because it is not the administrators or players that sustain the game. It is the cricket-loving public. It is their passion that powers cricket. And if they turn their backs on cricket, then the whole system will come crashing down. The solution to this may be the ICC taking a stand to suspend member boards with any direct detrimental political interference and allegations of corruption and mismanagement. 
This will negate the ability of those boards to field representative teams or receive funding and other accompanying benefits from the ICC.